being a technologist, I, I love to have the technology, and uh, as, as usual, it's doing its best to let me down and embarrass me. But uh, if you'll pardon me, death by PowerPoint, um, it's really there as a bit of background. As Michael has said, I'm a trade commissioner um, at the High Commission, and just to clear up one matter which already has arisen uh, shortly after my arrival, it is a High Commission and not an Embassy. And for those of you who may not be familiar with the distinction, a uh, High Commission has exactly the same uh, purpose and functions as an Embassy, exactly the same status in, in practical terms. It's just because Canada is still a member of the Commonwealth and the Queen is still the Head of State, that we have a High Commissioner rather than an Ambassador. Because as some of you may know, an Ambassador is the representative of his Head of State to the Court of St. James. Therefore, if we had an ambassador, he would be representing the Queen to the Queen. <laughs> so to get around that little anomaly, uh, they contrived this uh, concept of high commission. So you will find that the Commonwealth and uh, all the old Commonwealth countries generally will have a high commission rather than so, as I say, exactly the same purpose, functions, and all the rest. Uh, just a worth saying that you may be familiar with Canada House and Trafalgar Square, which was the original home of the High Commission, uh, created during the late 20s. Uh, and then during the 50s, we outgrew the facilities available to us in Trafalgar Square. And at the same time, the Americans were about to build their marvelous edifice on Grosvenor Square, uh, leaving vacant their old embassy on Grosvenor Square. So in fact, I'm based in the old American embassy on Grosvenor Square. Um, but shortly, uh, as you may have read in the press, the Americans are to vacate their current embassy and move to Battersea Power Station, and I'm sure all the local residents will breathe a sigh of relief when it finally happens. Um, and in the meantime, we are actually leaving, in all probability, Grosvenor Square ourselves. Um, part of the problems we have is that it's a building that needs a major refurbishment program, uh, and rather than move everybody out, uh, into another building, refurbish, move everybody in. The th current thinking is to move people out uh, and want to stop uh, to a new building, and a new building that's nearer to Canada House, which would uh, smooth uh, our operations and make it easier to move between the two buildings. So that's a little bit of history uh, about the High Commission itself. Uh, as, as was said, I'm a Trade Commissioner, and I'll explain for a moment in a moment what that is. So before I start, uh, Ron did brief me that uh, a lot of your interest uh, clearly will revolve around tourism. I am not a tourism specialist. However, over 30 years I've been to Canada many times, so I have a lot of personal experience uh, to draw upon, uh, and hopefully I'll be able to share a little bit of that. Um, but I, I also uh, owe a debt to my paymaster to, to give you a little bit of a sales pitch uh, uh, <laughs> on Canada from my own uh, perspective, uh, which will precede that. So. Uh, let me move swiftly on. So the Trade Commissioner Service, um, essentially what we do is these things here on the screen. So we are involved in trade promotion and the sense of helping Canadian companies who are interested in developing a market in the UK for their products and services. Trade policy, of course, which goes alongside that, particularly in some of the more sensitive areas uh, like agriculture, where the European Commission uh, doesn't take too kindly to imports from outside the European com community, if I can put it that way. Uh, foreign direct investment, so that is encouraging UK companies to <coughs> increase or establish uh, a presence in Canada, and that's something that we all get involved in to uh, some degree. Support for Canadian direct investment abroad, and you'll probably be surprised to discover how, quite how much Canadian investment there is in the UK, and I'll touch upon that a little bit later. And last but by no means least, science and technology collaboration, which is encouraging research community, be they in the private sector, like uh, Wellcome Laboratories, for example, is a good example, uh, or academia universities to develop research collaborations between the, the two countries. So that's, that's really what we do. So what I'm going to talk about uh, today is a little bit about the Canada-UK commercial relationship. Uh, and uh, why we think Canada is a good place to do business with, some opportunities for British companies, and last but by no means 
In no means least, I'm going to talk a little bit about tourism and the Vancouver Winter Olympics. And if we've got time, I've got a short four-minute promotional video on the Winter Olympics in Vancouver. Uh, Canada is very much a trading nation. Uh, the population is only half the size of the UK, uh, but 70% uh, of our gross, gross domestic product is related to international trade in some respect. And clearly, the United States is the biggest trading partner. But after that, the UK is, is the most important trading partner for Canada. Uh, and I'll just illustrate that with a few uh, little charts here, just give you a sense of what the main Canadian exports are to the UK. Still very much dominated by the resources, the metals, minerals, petroleum uh, type products, um, and a, a pretty much an even story amongst the others, perhaps machinery and equipment being a little bit bigger. And as I said before, the uh, UK is the second market for Canadian exporters, so it's very important for us. And in terms of Canadian imports from the UK, the UK is the sixth largest importer into Canada. And actually it's not that dissimilar pie chart when you compare that with the previous one. Very much dominated, rather surprisingly, perhaps by metals, minerals and petroleum products. Um, some selected Canadian investments in the UK. I hope everybody knows BlackBerry. Everybody heard of BlackBerry? Yeah. Good. Uh, perhaps less known uh, that Selfridges is owned by the Western family, as indeed is Primark and uh, Fortman and Mason. Uh, Huden is owned by a Vancouver-based company called Finning, and Finning is the world's largest distributor of Caterpillar tractors. They own Huden. Uh, Bombardier, perhaps not quite so familiar uh, name. Um, they are an aerospace company. They acquired Shorts, the aircraft building company in Belfast. Uh, so that's a, and they also very heavily into uh, rail transport. So they're involved with uh, providing uh, rolling stock for the London Underground, for example. Uh, Nortel is one of my companies. is a telecommunications company. Uh, British Telecom for a number of years was there, one of their biggest distributors worldwide. And next to it on the left, the latest amongst us, perhaps maybe more familiar with that name, yeah. Older, which is a shoe retailer, a Canadian owned. A relatively recent arrival uh, in the UK. Uh, just some uh, area that uh, is my particular baby, uh, a couple of uh, technology launches. Some of you may have read in your paper yesterday a new BlackBerry launched on the market by Vodafone, a new touchscreen BlackBerry which uh, compete with the Apple iPhone, which is pretty much high. But ha perhaps less known, uh, launched uh, with us just a couple of weeks ago, or not that actually, uh, an interesting little product from a company in Montreal, something called a Pocket Surfer. It's about the size of a spectacles case. Uh, as you see, it folds out to the top is the screen, and at the bottom is a keyboard. And it's designed for one thing really, and one thing only, is to give you access to the internet when you're walking around, um, or for people who don't perhaps have a, a fixed line internet connection at home. Lots of people these days don't have a fixed line, they have uh, a mobile phone, but no fixed line. So this is a way of giving you internet access. It's also great for caravanners, if there's any caravanners amongst you. Uh, they found a ready vein of interest uh, amongst caravans because it's great you put it in the caravan and you get access to your, your email, you can check up on uh, uh, your bank account or whatever. Um, and the novel thing about this is that they sell that um, unit plus a year's subscription for the recommended retailers uh, just under £200. So for £200 you get that device and for a year you get 20 hours a month usage. Uh, and for a mobile device, that's the fastest access to the internet um, that you will find on a mobile device. Even even faster probably than the new battery. <laughs> so that, that's a couple of uh, new technologies from uh, Canada. Um, obviously, in the, today's very uncertain climate, and I know there's a lot of discussion around the table today uh, about <coughs> the present uh, crisis. I suppose is not too strong a word for it. Uh, but we think that uh, Canada has actually got some very strong advantages in the present situation. 
um, one of which is, is a very strong uh, budget surplus. Unlike the UK, Canada's been running a budget surplus for a large number of years. Um, and in fact, in 2007, it was over $10 billion. Um, and there's a very cost competitive uh, business environment. Uh, Canadian banks have lower borrowing rates than most of their international peers, and obviously that's somewhat in flux at the moment. But I think you'll see the Canadian banks coming out of it very much stronger than they went into it because they haven't been exposed to some of the problems that the, uh, certainly the US banks and some of the uh, UK and European banks have had. And uh, you know, the country has some strong economic fundamentals, uh, as you see there. Um, and Canada, because it's a relatively small market domestically of only 13 million or so people, um, in fact, most Canadian companies regard the whole of the North American continent as their market. Uh, NAFTA, which is the North American Free Trade Agreement, which was signed a number of years ago, gives Canadian companies free uh, trade access to the whole of the US, Mexico, and they uh, also have a free access into Chile. Uh, and at the moment, there's been discussions on free trade with the European Union. <coughs> Obviously, uh, most people have uh, somewhat more on their mind at the moment than uh, negotiating free trade uh, with the EU, but nonetheless, um, the noises coming out of the EU have been quite positive on that. So some of the principal growth sectors, telecom, IT, uh, we see it probably in the UK, there are more Canadian companies in the telecom IT area uh, than in any other sector in the sense of companies who've established their own presence here, direct presence. Uh, energy and renewables, also a big area of growth for Canada. Lots of developments uh, on that front. Uh, aerospace and defence, historic ties. Uh, Bombardier is very big in aerospace and defence, and they have a kind of uh, industry that uh, supplies to them. Uh, Agri-food and fish, a uh, growing market for specialty products. It's quite interesting, it's not really my field, but uh, wandering around Selfridges is a a company from Toronto that uh, makes Italian style bread and that's being sold in Selfridges. Uh, construction and building products, clearly we've had a building uh, construction downturn in the present climate. But Canada has actually been very, uh, very successful in selling the concept of what's called Super E, energy efficient buildings. It's a bit of a buzz phrase but the so-called carbon neutral buildings that use minimal energy. Also, there's a lot of activity on the healthcare, um, innovative medical devices, uh, computer technology for health, and if I'm not mistaken, I think there's a company out of Edmonton that's working on a e-health project in this very borough of Fagan, uh, uh, my recollection is correct. Um, on the environment <coughs> side, lots of activity on waste diversion, uh, recycling, all those kinds of technologies. And metals and minerals, huge, uh, huge area for Canada. Um, not many people know that the uh, third largest exporter of diamonds, huge diamond industry now. De Beers is a big player in the Canadian market. And in the consumer products area, it's surprisingly a uh, growing market for Canadian uh, exclusive fashion design. And last but not least, of course, the UK has been uh, a very strong source of tourism for Canada. Uh, and in fact, the largest source outside the, the US, and over 900,000 visitors last year from the UK. So, opportunities for UK companies. The Olympics, of course, are coming on us quickly. Uh, a number of British companies are already um, looking at uh, opportunities there and working on projects. And the, uh, the organisers of both Vancouver and London have a very strong working relationship. And very much a similar philosophy of a sustainable games uh, wherever possible. So I think there's certainly opportunities there. Um, energy, lots of UK uh, activity in Alberta in particular, and I noticed in the uh, Telegraph uh, job section today is a big advert, display advert by Alberta looking for engineers to work in the energy industry. Uh, and alternative and clean energy technology opportunities, and lastly, obviously, ICT, aerospace, defence, environmental, medical, all opportunities for British companies. Right, now to the tourism part of the show. Uh, 
quick uh, straw poll. Who's been to Canada? Right, people. All right. Uh, who's been to the east coast of Canada? Right, there's a few people. Uh, west coast. That's where the most of the tourists tend to go. Yeah. Okay. Good. Good. Um, uh, I'll just ask another question here because you'll see the relevance in a minute. How many people actually use the internet on a regular basis or have access to the internet? Okay. Uh, the reason I mention that is that if you are interested in tourism information, uh, the Tourism Commission, which is a public-private partnership, doesn't now print their brochures. It's all available online and that's the place to go to, to get the information, canadatourism.com. But there are, you can probably still get brochures from some of the major uh, tourism resellers here, people like Titan and the Canadian Affair, uh, probably still do brochures, but the actual Tourism Commission doesn't anymore. So just to uh, give you a flavour, so starting out on the east here, we have uh, Newfoundland and Labrador and St John's. Uh, in actual fact, there's a lot of British people buying property, or were buying property in uh, Newfoundland. There's a new development there called, hum I think it's Humber Valley. Um, and that's attracted quite a lot of uh, investment from UK uh, people. Uh, moving, uh, moving west, after Newfoundland and Labrador, you have Nova Scotia, down the bottom there. New Brunswick, it's quite small provinces. Uh, hidden just above New, Br new Brunswick, you've got Prince Edward Island. Uh, Quebec, which is a huge province, goes right up to Hudson Bay there. Ontario, again around the lakes. Manitoba there right in the middle. And going left, going right across there. Saskatchewan, the Prairie Province. Alberta, oil capital of Canada. British Columbia and the Rockies, everybody knows. And then north of that you have the Yukon, Northwest Territories, and the latest territory called Nunavut. Uh, which covers all the uh, Aboriginal peoples that live there. I say all, there are not many of them live there. So, quick glimpse of what the um, countries like are uh, going from uh, east to west. So this is St John's in Newfoundland. Uh, and it's, as you see there, is a, it's quite an interesting little bay there uh, and port. And the actual entrance is incredibly narrow and they have some quite large ships going to that um, into that harbour. Um, so it's, when I've seen that, uh, it's always been a bit of a miracle to me that they managed to get through there without mishap. Uh, obviously they've got technology to, uh, to help them, but you do get quite a lot of fog in that area. Uh, so it's quite a challenge for a, a master of a ship to uh, navigate through the <coughs> cliffs. The cliffs rise with them at the entrance to the harbour. And as you see there, there's the cannon, the old historical uh, uh, connection. And in fact, that's where Marconi did his first wireless transmission across the Atlantic. Uh, and there's a little tower there, called, uh, something called Signal Hill, with a little museum, which is certainly worth a visit if you go to uh, Newfoundland and St. John's. And of course, it always, always blue sky and sunshine. <laughs> <laughs> Um, this may be familiar to some of you, uh, Nova Scotia, mm. the next maritime province, Peggy's Cove, and this is a typical Nova Scotia scene, lots of lighthouses, and the emblem of the province is the Blue Nose ship, sailing ship, and you see quite a few of those as well. And Halifax is the provincial capital, again it's another big port, important port uh, on the east coast. Incidentally, if anybody has any questions, just uh, and there are questions that I can answer sim simply and quickly, I'll, I'll happily take them now. Um, but if it's a more type of a philosophical answer that will need a little bit of thought and a little de more detailed answer, I'll take it at the end. Uh, so this is a picture of uh, Prince Edward Island, uh, which is the smallest uh, province, uh, and was home to the Anne Green Gables book. A lot of Japanese, surprisingly, go to Prince Edward Island in search of the, uh, the, the locations for Anne of Green Gables, which is all been a, something of a mystery to me. But it's a beautiful province, beautiful province, and uh, a relatively low-cost place to live, so a lot of Canadian families try to move there if they can. And joining uh, Prince Edward Island to the mainland in Brunswick is this amazing bridge called the Confederation Bridge, which is about, if memory serves me, about nine miles. Mm -hmm. I haven't driven over it myself. 
That's quite an experience. Mm -hmm. uh, so it joins from Edward Island to New Brunswick. So that's looking out from New Brunswick towards the island. And uh, as it says there, you know, it's the longest bridge over ice-covered waters in the world. So it's quite an amazing uh, construction. And if you, if you do a trip, uh, it's worth going to Nova Scotia, doing a trip around uh, Cape Breton, the area called Cape Breton in Nova Scotia, which is to the, to the west. Uh, and there's a ferry that goes from a place called Pictou across to Prince Edward Island. So get a boat across to the island and then take the um, drive across the bridge. And that, that's a great, uh, great way to do that uh, particular trip. Uh, now we're into French-speaking Canada with a vengeance. This is the Chateau Frontenac, of course, historical connections. Uh, it's the heights of Abraham where the Abraham would, uh, where the cannon are. Uh, so that's got a very historical uh, connection. Uh, beautiful city, very different to most cities in North America. Uh, and this is one of the old railway hotels. Uh, very typical style, that with the green copper roofs. And in most of the major cities in Canada, you'll see hotels of a similar style to that. So some of these rooms are quite amazing. I, I know I once stayed in a room that had one of, in one of these turrets, and, uh, which was quite uh, an interesting experience. All right, moving on, Ottawa, the capital, of course. Uh, and this is the ritual ice skating along the Rideau Canal. Uh, every winter, the level of the canal is lowered, uh, and le then it freezes, uh, and then people skate along it to work. <laughs> Obviously, they're not going to work, so that scene, that's probably the uh, Winterloo Carnival. Uh, but it's uh, very much a feature of Ottawa, is that uh, video canal. And there you see in the background is another one of the old railway hotel uh, style buildings. Uh, and then you've got the Parliament buildings, which are very much uh, echo Westminster in, in style. Ottawa is a city of temperature extremes. In the winter, it gets down to minus 40, and in the summer, it gets very hot and humid. So, uh, great extremes. Uh, Toronto, uh, that's just the famous CN Tower, which for a short number of years enjoyed the um, moniker of the tallest freestanding structure in the world. Uh, unfortunately, has uh, lost that uh, particular crown uh, a number of times, I think, to, to different buildings. So on the left is the kind of sunset style. Uh, over this side, the, the building at the bottom here is a baseball stadium. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's worth doing a tour of the, the baseball stadium. It's quite fascinating. Even if you're like me, you don't understand baseball. It's quite an interesting building. and. Uh, I think it was one of the first uh, sports stadiums that had a sliding roof. Um, so it's quite interesting to see how they, uh, they, they operate that, and you can do tours around it. And being right next to the CN Tower, it's quite convenient you can do both of those in one day. Uh, Winnipeg in the centre of the country, uh, typical sunset there. And again, Winnipeg in the, in the winter gets very cold, minus 40. Uh, has a Reputation, uh, if you stand on a couple of street corners there in the winter, the wind just howls in and frees you to the spot. Mm -hmm. uh, Saskatchewan, this is a bit of an unusual uh, geographic feature, the so-called Badlands. Um, but that's not a, in a sense, that's not a, a typical photo of Saskatchewan. The photos you generally see are acres and acres of wheat mm -hmm. and the grain elevator is the kind of typical mm -hmm. Saskatchewan landscape. But they also have these kind of geographic features as well. Uh, and I have to confess, this is one of my favourite spots in Banff, at the top of Sulphur Mountain. In fact, I took that photo myself on one of my many visits. Um, and you just go outside a short distance of the, the, the town of Banff, for those of you who've been, uh, past the, um, the new, new baths, not the old original baths, but the new ones. And um, there's a gondola that goes up to the top of Sulphur Mountain. And you get up to the top there, and the, the terminal of the gondola is here, and then you can just walk, go along a walkway up, up to the, the, the summit here. And it's uh, very, very pleasant, very pleasant. And you get a good view over, right over Banff. Is it, has anybody here been up Sulphur Mountain? Yes? Mm. Well, you haven't been up Sulphur Mountain? 
really long time ago, so I can't Well, next time you go to Banff, go up to Southwood Mountain. And here we go, the, the last uh, uh, railway hotel, really, when you go across the country in the west, uh, and that's in Victoria. Uh, beautiful old hotel with the, the ivy on the front. Uh, Victoria is a beautiful city. Um, anybody here been to Victoria? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Have you taken a float plane, any of you? Been on a float plane? That is a definite must do. If you go to Vancouver or to Victoria and you're going between the two, take the float plane. Take the ferry one way and take the float plane the other. We check, you know, if the weather is good, take the float plane. If the weather's not so good, visibility not so good, take the, the ferry and hope that the weather's good enough to take the float plane on the way back. I think that was one of the best trips I've done in Canada, is taking the float plane back from Victoria to Vancouver. Uh, and the weather was pretty much as you see it on that photo. It was beautiful blue sky. You go over <coughs> the islands that separate uh, Vancouver from Vancouver Island. There's a number of little islands. Uh, and because you're not that high up, you get a beautiful view of those islands and the sea lanes. And then as you come into Vancouver, you cross um, somewhere near the airport by the Delta, and you see the whole city laid out, and you come in and you land in the harbour in Vancouver, and it's an absolutely fantastic. It's a must-do if you're over in Vancouver or Victoria. Uh, moving north, this is in the Yukon, and the famous but elusive Northern Lights. Has anybody seen the Northern Lights? Yes? Well, you've been very lucky. Where did you see them? Did you see them Green in Greenland? Over right? Siberia. Siberia? Oh. That was where he was staying. Yeah. <laughs> 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 there were gulags. <laughs> in the Stalag. <laughs> gulag. Oh, gulag. Yes, that was well. <laughs> Northwest Territories. Um, we're now heading into parts of Canada I haven't been to, so there's not much I can tell you about the, uh, the, the area. And this is Rankin Inlet, which is on the um, Hudson's <coughs> Bay. It's, uh, and that symbol is, you'll see that, you may have noticed it when I did the start slide of the tourism piece, because it's a, mm -hmm. a logo, if you will, of the uh, Tourism Commission. So that, that is a, an actual native construction. I'm not quite sure what it means, but... Um, you know, you see those used quite extensively, and also in the Vancouver 2010 uh, promotional <coughs> videos and pictures, you see that symbol uh, quite often. Right, moving on to the Olympics. That's the Vancouver skyline at the top, with the North Shore Mountains uh, in the background. <coughs> Just a few facts and figures about the Olympics. The sheer scale and numbers, which anybody familiar with the London 2012 Olympics will be quite familiar with these kinds of numbers, uh, but it's quite staggering uh, when you see what, uh, what is involved. Uh, one thing I should say about the venues that they're using in Vancouver, they've all got an allocated use after the Games. It's been decided what all the venues are going to be used for. They all have a use. So seven of the nine competition venues have already been completed. Uh, construction of the remaining ones is underway. Now for each village is well underway. So just to show you here, this is where the airport is in Vancouver. If those of you have arrived in Vancouver by air, uh, the skating will be in Richmond, which is just adjacent to uh, the airport. And then in the centre is where a lot of the uh, main activities take place. And then up here in the north, is uh, Whistler, where the ski events uh, take place. And there's some events at Cypress Mountain, which is uh, not too far away from the city itself. But certainly when I was there a few years ago, there was major construction uh, to improve the highway up to Whistler. Who, anybody been to Whistler? Yeah, so you know what the highway used to be like, probably. It wasn't, wasn't terribly good, was it? Not good. It used to take you quite a while to, to get up there, so they've, they've been doing a lot of work on that, so that would be greatly improved. And of course, the Whistler is one of the 
uh, most popular ski resorts in uh, in the world if uh, not Canada in North America. So uh, anyone who wants more information, again, uh, unfortunately, this is all web-based information. For the three main sites, the, there's the official <coughs> Canadian government uh, 2010 website, that first one. Uh, there's the, the 2010 site, which contains information about uh, tickets. Uh, also has information if you are a company wanting to sell to the uh, Olympics. And then lastly, uh, the destination one, which, as, as the name suggests, is all about tourism at the games. How are we doing for time? So that's the contact uh, for more information. And uh, if I've got a few minutes, I will show the promotional video. So that's a symbol again. Did the <coughs> did the eagle was he in yes, he was. Calgary? Yeah. I apologize for the quality of the computer file and uh, but that computer struggles a little bit with video. <coughs> This is a sky train for those of you who have been on mm -hmm. it. Mm -hmm.
In view of the enormous size of the Northwestern Territories and possible mineral deposits and so on, does the federal government have an ongoing program for opening it up uh, in the very near future? Uh, that is a very tricky political question. I don't know the answer, uh, so I, trying to answer it would be um, foolish when I don't know the answer. So, um, but I mean, if you if you want, I can go back and get an answer for you. But it's not something that I have the uh, the answer like that on. And because we are in a, an election mode anyway, there's an election next week. So whatever I say today may not be true next week. <laughs> Take that. Yes, yeah, sorry. Just one question. What's the land mass by comparison with the UK? You've got, we've got twice as many people as you. How many, how many? Um, good question. I, I couldn't give you the numbers straight off the top of my head, but I can tell you that Western Europe would fit into Ontario. <laughs> Comfortably. That gives you a sense. So we'll come back with another one. Yeah. Um, Hopefully have, you finished, the last one. <laughs> have you finished the Valders inquiry yet? Has it been tied up? Uh, again, I don't know the answer to that. It's not my <laughs> 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 oh, you're coming out with some difficult questions. <laughs> <laughs> you might have briefly. Yeah. Yeah. Pierre Trudeau was thoroughly trounced in the election, and the Liberal Party died, I think, as a result of it. Has it resurged yet? Uh, well, you'll probably find out next week. I don't know the answer to that one either. One more question. Hopefully, of a less political nature. When General Gaulle was with us, he was very fond of championing the Quebec Wars. Has the problem in relation to that part of the province of Canada, in relation to the rest of the province, is. Can't hear you, Dick. I'm talking about the problem, the, the French the Quebec separation. cultural problems between French Canada, Quebec, and the rest of Canada, yeah. uh, and how that was sparked up by our dear friend General de Gaulle, which I said no. Yeah. Um, I'm wondering, in fact, whether uh, Canada has got beyond that now. Well, there's been two referendums, and on both occasions, they, uh, the Quebecois have voted to stay within Canada. A lot of it comes down to economic reality, and I think events in the last couple of weeks, if uh, none other, have uh, focused people's minds on uh, the difficulty of being a small country. Iceland, a classic example. Um, Scotland, uh, talk of devolution, further devolution from Alex Salmond. Uh, I think uh, is, is looking a little bit <laughs> unwise, shall we say? Right, then I'll hand you over to the chat. On behalf of uh, my fellow Rotarians, I would like to thank you for your enlightenment, um, particularly new technologies to Canada and the forthcoming Winter Olympics. Um, personally, I'd like to say, having been a recent tourist to Toronto, I wish I had you as my guide. <laughs> <laughs> Let's put our hands together to give him a... Yeah. Yeah. A very quick single sentence announcements from any of our committee members and chairman. <laughs> no? Oh, <there>. <laughs> <laughs> For those going to Homeless Carl next week, uh, stay back for a few minutes to have a quick chat afterwards. Thank you. Mr. President, is there anybody who is able to give me a lift down to Upminster Station? Yes, I'm sure.
Yeah. You come with me. And there you are. You've got one, two. That's it. Fine. Okay. Lovely. Thank you. Any we'll other business? Half, I sure. hope not. And then we should push yeah. on with uh, reminders, apologies, books, menu.